So uh, before we discuss undergraduate perspectives, I wanted to get us all in the mindset of, of reflection a bit here. Uh, first and foremost, as you listen to, to the upcoming perspectives, uh, we invite you to call to mind the students in your classes and the challenges that you and they have overcome to date or perhaps are still facing. I'm going to give it just 30 seconds of silence right now for you to just group, to set aside all the other things going on in your day right now, which I know there are many, and to just think a bit about who your students are and what they might be grappling with. Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, we'd like you to think about the following prompts. These are by no means a uh, requirement. We're not going to be asking you to type these or submit them anywhere, but uh, potentially as a way to help you think about how the session might be useful to you. As the coming hour develops, you might think about answering the question, I'm realizing that blank, uh, a new perspective on your student struggles. Uh, a new way you need to address the next two weeks of content, something related to assessment. Maybe you have a particular issue with a student that you are working through now. And slightly more specifically, in order to help students for the next few weeks, I might blank. And this might be in the realm of pedagogy, teaching, it might be reaching out to students individually, it might be uh, shifting gears a little bit to keep students motivated and engaged. Again, absolutely not required, but some helpful steps that might be useful to you. Okay, so we're starting with undergraduate perspectives. Uh, these perspectives were shared by Dr. Karen Gosling, who is the founding director of the Academic Strategies Program here in the Porvoo Center which provides uh, all kinds of support by way of uh, programming and individual engagements for undergraduates. Karen and her team are hearing from undergraduates a lot and all the time about the issues that they are facing uh, generally and in the midst of this pandemic right now. Uh, Karen, are you with us? Okay, that's fine. Uh, Karen shared these talking points that we will go over. So first and foremost, uh, Karen shared a lot about just the nature of uncertainty in these times. Uh, and this crosses all dimensions from personal to professional uh, to sort of next steps in students' lives. Uh, there are all kinds of concerns about mental health, physical well-being of themselves and of others. A lot of students are sharing deep economic insecurities that they are facing. Students who are going back home and being asked to uh, join or rejoin parents' jobs and provide a lot more support and work and help at home that were not balances they were intending or planning on having to juggle right now. Uh, a lot of students are sharing childcare and homeschooling responsibilities. Of course, we as instructors are dealing with this as well, difficulties with, the, with the, the home environment in terms of finding time to run a workshop. And I apologize if my two boys make a uh, auditory appearance. And of course, technology resources, students who are in rural environments with few Wi-Fi availability or uh, devices that are not just up to speed to, to ensure a smooth Zoom experience. There's also a lot of disruption in undergraduate student lives in terms of summer work, study abroad, things that are suspended, students who need to come up with more than one contingency plan in order to find funding for, this, for the summer, to uh, scramble and rearrange the distribution requirements that they were planning on for the coming year. And this goes especially for graduating seniors who are walking into a scary, scary employment environment. And for those going into graduate school, we know that Yale just announced and many universities have announced uh, a cessation of all hiring for the coming year. And that is impacting graduate student and graduate school admissions in various ways. Uh, Karen wants to 
relay to us that merely an awareness of these facts can be a huge, huge advantage for students. Instructors who vocalize that they are aware that students are experiencing all of these issues can help students feel a sense of calm, feel a sense of belonging, that their challenges and difficulties are welcome in the classroom and have been understood as part of class. In terms of class itself, uh, I'm, I'm guessing almost every participant here has experienced this as well. Uh, students are adjusting to the online classroom in very, very different ways. They are having to manage weirdly more and less details on their own and doing that as their schedules permit. Everything takes longer to complete. Absolutely everything does uh, because students are also realizing that the built-in ways to recharge throughout their day are gone. The act of walking across the quad is gone. The act of running into a friend in the hallway and catching up is gone. Uh, what this means is that exhaustion looks different than it used to. There is a slow burn to this time and to this season that students are, many of them just now starting to feel. So an awareness that we're kind of in a pandemic midterm even now can be helpful in thinking through why a student might be delayed in responding to, to a prompt that you've offered in class. And then the issue that we are, all of us facing, social isolation and the challenge of, of motivation. Uh, I mentioned that that sense of social recharge is also the intellectual need to recharge that students are, are missing right now. That, that, uh, that moment where a class discussion just really gets going and students feel like they're contributing something. It can still happen in Zoom, but it can be more difficult to obtain and then to hold on to when it's happening. Uh, the, the physical co-presence together also creates a sense of purpose on campus uh, that students might feel is lacking in this environment right now. And of course, uncertainty in general can just be paralyzing. It's difficult for students to find reasons to motivate beyond getting a grade. And with the introduction of the universal pass-fail this past week, you might be experiencing or about to experience that sense of lack of motivation even more heightened in your classes. We would love to discuss that with you one-on-one -on -one and in the course of this workshop today. So Karen shared these points for twofold reasons. Number one, just to ensure that we as instructors are hyper aware of these stress points on students' lives and are regularly reminding them that we know. I often use the metaphor of, of my own children. I have a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old. And at first, I thought that they weren't hearing me because they were trying to just drive me crazy, and maybe they are, but often they don't hear me when I tell them to do something or ask them to do something simply because of cognitive load. They are biologically not hearing me. And I need to repeat myself multiple times or over the course of a day in order for something to sink in. It's the same way with students, not to liken four-year-olds to, to 18, 19, 20-year-olds, but students, even in a normal semester, are juggling a lot, as we are. Right now, with pandemic and anxiety encroaching, they're juggling even more. So regular reminders that, even though it sounds cliche, we are all in this together, uh, that you understand their struggles and experiencing your own can be a huge lift to student motivation and to student mental health. Uh, the other thing Karen wanted me to mention is that the academic strategies team has a bevy of student mental health resources that they are developing and have developed. We'll make sure we get those to you. And a lot of the issues that we're addressing right now are things that you can find specific support for uh, in the coming days. Uh, so with that said, we're gonna move to graduate perspectives. And here I'd like to introduce Gina Hurley, 
Jin is the assistant director for the graduate and postdoctoral teaching development team. I'll also add that Gina is a graduate student about to be doctor uh, here at Yale University. And so she can also share some pretty on the ground intimate perspectives about student graduate student life here. So Gina, take it away. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kyle. And I, and I will say that when I submitted my dissertation on Friday the 13th, it already seemed like a portentous date and it has just turned out to be more so. Uh, so I will be sharing um, both, both my own reflections and um, things that we've been hearing from graduate students. Thanks, Megan. Um, from graduate students uh, in our sessions, as well as our graduate fellows who um, are a just fabulous group drawn from across the disciplines of the university uh, who sort of have an ear to the ground in their various departments, uh, which include uh, sort of the sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences, as well as the School of Public Health. Uh, so I did want to say I've been I've been reflecting a little bit about the list that I've I've given Carl, Kyle here, and uh, one of the things that I notice about it right off the bat um, is that in some cases the things that I'll be talking about will apply to both postdoctoral scholars and to graduate students, and so I'll be I'll be mindful of um, suggesting when the observations here uh, really sort of extend to both audiences that we work with in our unit. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say is that um, research shows us that graduate students are already vulnerable relative to the general population to mental illness. Um, and so that includes depression and anxiety as well as a sort of social isolation. Um, and this situation is likely to worsen, uh, to worsen their symptoms because they're being sort of taken out of the rhythms of everyday life in the way that all of us are. And so that's, that's a sort of um, sense that I think we all can relate to, to some degree, um, that this is incredibly disruptive and incredibly anxiety producing. And I think it's important to recognize that the pressures that are already put on graduate students, uh, both within their programs and within the structure of a broader academic job market, have only sort of increased in the last uh, weeks slash years uh, that we've been, that we seem to have been enduring this. Uh, and so that it's important to sort of know what resources are available to students who may be struggling. So that includes uh, sort of Yale Mental Health uh, and the expanded services that they've been offering um, in light of the, um, the, the sort of difficulties of doing in-person consultations. So graduate students also will have family members, as do we all, that require more of their attention um, than they might under ordinary circumstances. So that might apply to family members who are older or who are ill themselves. So they might be in the position of caretakers. Um, they might also have children um, who they are now in charge of their education. And so the degree to which uh, they are they are experiencing a sort of heightened responsibility uh, at this moment may be something that you wish to investigate with your with your mentees and i'm sure that that is something that many of you will be experiencing yourselves um, at this at this moment and that also means that we should pay attention to the fact that many graduate students, many postdoctoral scholars, and many academics in general are often geographically isolated from their families. And so that means that sort of different cycles of the illness are hitting different parts of their families at different times. And when we uh, sort of in Connecticut, in New Haven, in the US, uh, one day come out of this, it may mean that they still have family members who are being impacted uh, by the pandemic and also by the, the sort of economic effects thereof. So there's also the thing that we should um, look forward to, which is an even worse job market than usual. So essentially what we are hearing from graduate students is that searches are being count, uh, canceled right, left, and center. That is true um, at both the postdoctoral level and at the faculty level. Um, so this includes searches where students may already have advanced pretty far in their, in their candidacy for a particular position, which is especially disappointing. Uh, but it also is something that will be affecting both your, your graduate students, your postdoctoral scholars, and those members of your departments who might be in contingent or term limited positions. So something that will be affecting a lot of people 
at the same time, our own funding at Yale, the graduate student school is currently deciding um, to what degree they will be able to extend additional funding uh, to those students who will be most affected by this downturn and by uh, the, the sort of inability to complete their research in the fashion that they might have otherwise. So that adds up to a lot of uncertainty about future prospects here at Yale and elsewhere. And it also means that the sort of traditional divide in the market, the academic job market, and then sort of industrial and alt acquisitions, it's not clear that either of those is going to be a particularly promising outlet for students who are struggling to find employment after their graduate career here. Uh, so it's more important than ever to have frank discussions with your students about the full range of, of their options as they finish their degrees. But even finishing their degrees is going to prove difficult uh, in this particular situation. And that's for a whole range of reasons. Everything that we've already talked about, these sort of emotional and psychological pressures that come with a situation like this one, but also a lack of access, a lack of access to labs, a lack of access to archives, a, la a lack of access to libraries. So there are many dissertations that are going to have to be sort of put on hold or even refocused in response to a restriction in students' abilities to complete their plans as they might have imagined them at the start. So those are restrictions that can delay their progress through a particular program. But it's also restrictions that will delay um, their ability to prepare for the job market. Students will find that their publications might be delayed as, as particular journals suffer from you know, funding shortages or, or um, employment shortages. It might also prevent them from being able to go to conferences. While some conferences have gone online, uh, I can report that not all of them have. And so that means that the sort of regular feedback that students can uh, receive from people outside of their home institution is going to be interrupted. And so it's more important than ever to really take a closer look at the, the research of your mentees to help them sort of brainstorm ways to keep working if they feel able to do so in a time where their traditional methods um, are, are sort of unavailable to them. And then finally, I want to say that graduate students are finding themselves isolated from the sort of rhythms of campus life. We heard this from our uh, undergraduates, and we also, I think, are all experiencing it right now ourselves. Uh, but there's so much about the work that we do that is informed by the collectives we build. Uh, so I can, I can say, having just completed um, the dissertation, that that process is a reflection of thinking how so many of my best insights and most exciting work has come out of conversation with my colleagues, with my advisors, with other mentors. And that is something that is really hard to replicate at this particular moment in our, in our trajectory here. And so to the extent that it's possible, it's important to think about ways that you can create some semblance of intellectual community online that might look like continuing to share work um, to the extent that you did or perhaps to a greater extent, uh, convening more reading groups or expanded versions of ones that already exist or continuing journal clubs. Anything that creates a sense that students have both the intellectual outlet of their department available to them, and then also all of the sort of casual social interactions that come of that. Uh, the unfortunate part about Zoom is that you're unlikely to catch someone in the hallway for a quick, uh, for a quick catch up, but it's better than nothing. Uh, and I think that it's important to sort of grab on to any opportunity that you have to create the sense of, um, of what we tend to call social presence that is so strong in so many of our departments here at Yale. Thank you, Gina, thank you so much. Uh, so in the interest of time, we're just gonna move on to our, to our uh, final slide on general strategies, many of which we've discussed and, and have heard uh, people share already. Uh, and again, encourage you, if you'd like to follow up on any of this, to please email us. Uh, you can email us through 
the academic uh, continuity page or I'm gonna put my email in the chat window here just to ensure everyone has it. Please feel free to reach out back to me as well. So in terms of general strategies, uh, the, the first one is where we started in this workshop today. Remember student mental health in whole context. Keep in mind as often as you can what students are experiencing. Uh, in particular, you might keep this in mind during final assessments as those come up and the challenges that students might be facing. Uh, as individual issues arise, we know that it can be a lot easier to cheat, to perform academic dishonesty in this setting. Even there, it's important to ask as best as possible, why might this be happening? What stresses or anxieties might the student be facing that might have led them to make a decision uh, like this? And in the coming weeks, particularly as the pandemic reaches its, its peak nationally, uh, it's going to be difficult to ignore to the extent that you're trying to do that, the news as that happens, and students will undoubtedly be experiencing, uh, as well as we, intrusions of this into their own lives. In terms of curriculum, something we didn't really discuss a whole lot today, but it's important to assume a balanced approach to discussing the global event in your class and to review and be sensitive to potential areas in your coursework where a discussion might more naturally happen or take place. Uh, landing on discussing the pandemic too much could be a deterrent to student mental health in the sense of uh, putting too fine a point on it for somebody who's experiencing something dramatic in their own lives right now. Not discussing it at all could potentially be a deterrent as well uh, to mental health if it is causing students a sense that, that they are not uh, welcome to share a topic of conversation. So to the extent that you can be aware of student desires to discuss the event itself, and people shared great strategies like the open office hours and icebreakers and, and spaces in class, to be aware of that uh, can be helpful. If you're teaching a course that might be more prone to discussing pandemic, uh, public health, economics, uh, humanities courses where plague and disease feature as prominent tropes and themes. If this has not already happened, where students make a connection with the global pandemic, it might happen. So thinking ahead about how you're going to address that can be really, really healthy. And we at the Porter Center are, are very happy to, to talk through that with you. This has been an ongoing piece of advice from us to you. Continue to consider flexibility in assignments and assessments and modes of participation. This goes back to Peter's comment about time zones. Some students might just not be at their best at 3 a.m. And it's amazing that they are that they're showing up. It's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, at the same time, how can you help support students in their given situations that they have been forced into? Check in socially with students. This has been the major topic of conversation today in this workshop, but find ways to do that uh, as a whole group. We, we at the Porvo think that one of the very best things that can happen right now is for your cat to walk across your keyboard. It really, really is an amazing thing because we all know that the students want to see your cat way more than they want to hear about the content of the, of the, of the class today. Uh, we're all seeing each other's animals and uh, hearing each other's siblings and spouses and things like that. That is great because more often than not, or it can be great, there are students who are worried about their situation and hoping that it doesn't impede upon class or are only seeing these things as challenges and burdens. Seeing the professor, the instructor, and fellow students grappling with the exact same things can be great for belonging and it'd be great for, for uh, curbing anxiety about how they are doing in class. Remember that Yale students by, by and large are, the, are the, the, the top from their high school classes. These are the students who know how to perform college well. It's difficult to perform college well remotely over Zoom. So moments like this can be really helpful. Uh, if you experience an incident, uh, a student says something that is particularly volatile or emotional, we're first of all gonna have a resource posted by the end of this week or early next week on how to deal with uncivil commentary. But for now in the moment, 
it's best to pause conversation, address the emotions in the room, but ask students to write privately for a few moments. Uh, the best thing to do is diffuse the emotions as quickly as possible and ensure that every student feels like they have a space to collect their thoughts privately and then share them publicly with more calm and more forethought than they otherwise might if they're lashing out, which the, the internet environment tends to allow in ways that being in class physically doesn't. And again, look for more resources on that in the coming week. And finally, we encourage you to be proactive. Uh, reach out if you see a student struggling and they have not reached out to you. Especially now, it's much better to have been a little more proactive than to have let something slide. Because chances are all that student is needing is someone to ask what's going on. Or they might not even realize the extent to which their struggles are apparent to you or to others. So we encourage you to the extent that you feel comfortable respecting privacy and your, your current relationships, feel free to be proactive and to reach out to your students in, in case of need. If you are experiencing or see a student experiencing a, 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 a far deeper issue, it's also important to reach out to the residential college dean to ensure that the dean is aware and to see what kinds of support the dean might already be, be providing uh, to, to a given student. And we wish you all the best in the coming weeks. Feel free to reach out at any time. And thanks for being here.